I want to thank uh, Brooklyn College and specifically the Anthropology Department and the History Historical, Historical Club yes. and Anthropological Club okay. for sponsoring this. Thank you very much. Uh, one of my areas of interest was the relationship between Judaism and Zionism. And what I found is that there's, there's so much propaganda, indoctrination, false information, misinformation, disinformation, lying on the top of the truth that it's really very hard to get to it. And whether people are Zionist or anti-Zionist, on both of the sides, there are very few people who even understand what Zionism is or, or why it was even invented. So first we're going to start with Judaism. People always ask, is there a relationship between Judaism and Zionism? Is Zionism Judaism? The Zionists will tell you definitely yes. The anti-Zionists will tell you definitely no. Here's why this is a strange question. What is a Jew? Now, everybody, every Tuesday and Thursday, you're going to find articles in places that say, what is a Jew? Is a Jew an ethnicity? Is a Jew a religion? Is a Jew a ethnic religion or a religious ethnicity? Now, the Jews are the only people in the world, the only group, not only people, the only group in the world that there's such a mystery surrounding their identity. There is no other group, be it the Catholics or the Protestants, the Americans, the Japanese, the Met fans, or the, the, the Boston Red Sox, um, that doesn't know what they are. Everybody knows what they are. Why don't people know what the Jews are? Why are there so, so much debate around that question? Well, the answer is this. This is Judaism 101. The story of the Jews is as follows, and this is how the Jews identified, self-identified for thousands of years. There's a story in the Bible that says in the Old Testament about God giving the law to Moses and the Jews at Mount Sinai. At that time, when the Jews got the law, the law required them to fulfill 613 commandments. Judaism is a universal religion, and according to Judaism, everybody is obligated, everybody in the world, to fulfill seven mitzvahs, seven commandments. They're called the Noahide laws. You're not allowed to kill, you're not allowed to steal, you're not allowed to worship idols. You have to create some kind of system of law. It doesn't have to be Jewish law, some kind of civil law. You're not allowed to break a, you're not allowed to tear a limb off a live animal and eat it. That's one of the seven, technically. But Jews are obligated to fulfill 613. I'm not even going to use the word Jews. There are others who were at Mount Sinai who God gave the Torah to, they are obligated to fulfill 613 commandments. Those who are obligated to fulfill 613, they are called Jews. That's it. The definition of a Jew according to Judaism, the way Jews have self-identified for thousands of years is simply, we Jews are obligated to fulfill more commandments than the rest of the world. We are not allowed to work on the Sabbath. We have to only eat kosher food. We have to wear tzitzis, um, tefillin in the morning, all of these things. Anybody who is obligated to fulfill those commandments are Jews. There is no other difference between Jews and non-Jews except for the religious obligations that the Jews are obligated to fulfill. And again, I don't want to say that there are people called Jews who these Jews have obligations. No. The definition of a Jew is somebody who has these obligations. A Jew, you could say, is a job description. A job description given by God. Like there's a policeman who's obligated to fulfill the duties of a policeman. There's a fireman who's obligated to fulfill the duties of a fireman, and there are Jews who are obligated to fulfill these 613 commandments. This creates various different uh, spiritual realities. There's a whole theology behind it, but that's all the definition of a Jew is. About a thousand years ago, Rabbi Sadia Gon made a statement, and he stated this succinctly. He said, our Ummah, if you are familiar with Arabic or if you are uh, familiar with, with Islam, you'll know that there's such a thing as an Ummah. The Jews also refer to themselves as Ummah. But Ein Ummah Isainu Ummah, our Ummah is only an Ummah, our people are only a people, Ella Bisayrasa, only because of their Sharia. Rabbi Sadia, by the way, wrote this book in Arabic and it's translated into Hebrew. The Arabic word that he used is Sharia. We are only a people because of our faith. 
If God would take away the law from the Jews, there would be no more Jews. Not we would be Jews without a law. There would be no more Jews. In fact, in context, I'm not trying to convince anybody to convert to my religion here, not at all, but just academically, the context that Rabbi Sadia wrote this was there, there are, um, there's a concept that the Muslims have, they call it abrogation, which means that God took the law and now gave it from the Jews to uh, the Muslims. Rabbi Sadia wants to refute the, work, the principle of abrogation that the Muslims had, and he says, he brings verses from the Bible that says the Jewish people will exist forever. And he says, if the Jewish people will exist forever, that means also they must have the law forever. Because if the Jews would have the law removed from them, they would not be called Jews. The definition of the word Jew is somebody who is obligated in this law. That's it. Now again, I'm not trying to convince you of my religion, but Rabbi Sadia was defending it. Again, he lived in Egypt, in Fayum, about a thousand years ago, and he was defending Judaism, and that's the context. Our people are only a people because of this law. Without the law, no Jews. Before the law, no Jewish people. There may have been individuals who were righteous, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but before the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, there was no Jewish people, no Jewish unit, no Jewish community, no Jewish, we'll call it for lack of a better term, nation, even though nation is not a really accurate word. This is how Jews have identified for thousands of years. Now, the job of these Jews, this is a, a God-given lifestyle. In order to fulfill these 613 commandments, it's a li it involves, it's a lifestyle. And the theme of the Jews, what do the Jews do? How do they act? Is right here. It's, in, it's a verse in the Psalms. We call it the Book of Tehillim, 27.3, in Hebrew. Achas Shaltimeis Hashem, King David, who by the way had, was a king and he had an army. And the world, people look at King David in the media as some kind of warrior, kind of like Ragnar Lothbrok with a yarmulke. And, but that's not how we look at King David. We look at King David as a righteous rabbi. And all his wars that he fought were fought miraculously through God. He did not have big muscles. He, he did not know how to shoot arrows better than anybody else. It was all a gift of God. And here in the book of Psalms, which was, which was written by King David, he wrote, and this is the theme of the Jews. One thing I ask of Hashem, that's God in, in Judaism, only that I will seek. What is it? That I may dwell in the house of Hashem all the days of my life to see the pleasantness of Hashem and to visit his temple to sit in the study hall and study the religion and study the Torah and serve God. That's all the Jews ever wanted. Jews we know were confined to ghettos, but the Jews themselves a thousand years ago were the ones that asked to be confined to ghettos. And the reason is, do you ever cram for a test in your life? When you cram for a test, you shut off your phones, keep everybody out and say, look, just leave me alone. I'll come back to civilization after the, after the examination. We Jews in this world are studying for a test after we die then God gives us a test to see our behavior and our knowledge that we acquired in this world. Afterwards, we'll be still around for billions and billions of years for all of eternity. And how we score on that test will determine our fate forevermore. So the Jews had this, this life mission of studying the Torah and serving God and collecting the mitzvahs, the, the commandments, fulfilling them, so that we'll be able to reap the rich reward reserved for anybody who wants them. By the way, anybody can be a Jew. Uh, even though I'm not trying to convince anybody to convert to my religion, you may if you want to. There are plenty of people who convert. It's not that the Jews, it's not a race, it's not an ethnicity. There are Jews of any, all ethnicities. There are Ethiopian Jews, there are Yemenite Jews, there are uh, German Jews, Russian Jews. Ivanka Trump converted to Judaism. She's probably the most famous convert. She and the Syrian Jews, there are Syrian Orthodox Jews, a whole bunch of them live not far from where we are now, around Ocean Parkway and Kings Highway. That's a whole 
Orthodox Syrian neighborhood. They are of the same different ethnicities, but they all are commanded in the same 613 commandments, and that makes them Jews. And so the Jews said, look, we need to have our own neighborhoods, you know, their Jews kind of consolidate themselves into their own neighborhoods because we need, we need special schools. I went to school not far from here. Uh, school's still there, now it's a lot bigger. We need special schools that teach Torah. We need special uh, prayer uh, synagogues where we can get together in a quorum and pray to God together. And we need kosher food, so we have kosher stores, and you'll find neighborhoods with kosher stores. It has nothing to do with ethnic food. You go on Coney Island Avenue, down Avenue J, the kosher food is pizza and sushi mostly. <laughs> There's no such thing as Jewish food, they're, they're Jewish ethnic food, you know? I mean, there are foods that Jews, Ashkenaz Jews, by the way, uh, is one ethnicity, uh, the bagels and lox thing, that's an Ashkenaz thing, but Sephardic Jews from Morocco, Yemen, uh, Syria, Turkey, they have all sorts of food that I can't even pronounce. There's baklava and, and, and uh, all sorts of things that, that are Arabic, that are Arab, it's Arabic food. There's no, eth, not, no such thing as an ethnic Jew. There's no such thing as a, a Jewish DNA. Ivanka Trump, she has no Jewish DNA for crying out loud. Her father is Donald Trump. How far from being a Jew can you get? And, but there's only these commandments. One thing, and by the way, this, this I must tell you, every Jewish child knows this verse in, in Psalms by heart and they sing it. This is like the theme of Judaism. If you want to know one verse that's a theme of Judaism, that's it. Every Jewish child sings this in a soul, soulful melody. There are choirs, there are bands, and this is, this is the theme of Judaism. This is all we ever wanted. Now, here's the problem. Things were going like that for literally many, many centuries. Until there was the emancipation, by the way, there was no Jewish, never any Jewish art or uh, architecture, uh, no Jewish science, scientists, there were doctors like Maimonides, but it wasn't a goal that Jews pursued, and not that there's anything wrong with sports or architecture or art at all, it's just that it wasn't, when you're cramming for a test, you don't have time for that. After I'm dead and um, God gives me the test, then I'll worry about drawing pictures. Uh, but th right now, this as a community, that was the, the goal of the Jews. And Jews, by the way, were always literate. The compulsory education in Europe started in France in the mid-1800s. Amongst the Jews, 2,000 years ago, there was a high priest, Yeshua ben Gamla, that made a decree. Any town that doesn't have an educational system for the children has to be dismantled. You dismantle the entire town. Without an educational system, you cannot have a town. But there was no fiction literature the Jews had back in the day. Why would we make fiction literature? A story that never happened? It's not our thing. Poetry, only religious poetry. Just random poetry, not so much. Until the emancipation and the enlightenment where religion lost its um, authority and the Jews were allowed to leave the ghettos, and they were, for the first time in many centuries in Europe, we're talking about, allowed to uh, go to university. They were allowed to, in many places, have even farmland. And there were many Jews that decided, you know, they don't want the Jewish lifestyle. They'd rather be a regular German or a regular Frenchman. And they tried doing it. But here's the problem. It didn't work. It didn't work. Anti-Semites attacked those Jews as well. In Russia in 1881, there began a succession of terrible pogroms that killed hundreds and hundreds of Jews, and there are accounts that are even more than that. And many of those Jews were just assimilated non-religious Jews. They didn't even identify as Jews. There were Jews who would convert to other religions, um, but that somebody should be just secular person and still call himself a Jew, an atheist Jew, that was like an oxymoron. There may be a quirky exception or two, Benedict Spinoza perhaps, depends who you ask. But in general, a Jew meant somebody who was religious. But the problem was that they, when the anti-Semites attacked these Jews, now they had a, a quandary. Why are we being attacked? Why are we being killed by the anti-Semites, the Ukrainians, the Russians? Why do they hate me? Do they hate me because I'm Jewish? But me, I'm not Jewish. I'm a regular German. Could be a blonde haired, blue eyed Jewish guy. He didn't even think of himself as a Jew, he thought of himself more as a German. I, I don't want to be Jewish. Those Jews, not for me. 
What am I? In the book that I wrote about Zionism, the subtitle is, it's called The Empty Wagon, Long story about the title, but the subtitle, Zionism's Journey from Identity Crisis to Identity Theft. This was the identity crisis. There were Jews who were persecuted by the anti-Semites, even though they had not one Jewish bone in their body. Technically, they were still obligated to fulfill the 613 commandments, because if you're born to a Jewish mother, God said, this is your, you don't have a choice. If you're not Jewish, you have a choice, you can convert. But if you're born to a Jewish mother, you have to fulfill the 613 commandments, but the Russian anti-Semites didn't believe that. In those sense, these people were still Jewish, but in no other sense of the word. So why are they being persecuted? And that was the big question. And there are various different answers. What do we do about this anti-Semitism? So there were communists, there were Jewish communists that said, you know what, if we get communism off the ground, everybody will be treated equally. That'll be the end of anti-Semitism. But there were, and there are various other different theories. There was a theory of Zionism. The theory of Zionism is that the reason why there is anti-Semitism is because, <laughs> just look at the Jews. The Jews, they're dirty, they're disgusting, they're immoral. I have no doubt that I am a Zionist, Vladimir Jabotinsky said, one of the founding fathers of Zionism, because the Jewish people is a very nasty people and its neighbors hate it and they're right. Vladimir Jabotinsky. These guys said anti-Semitism was actually justified. Now this, these quotes, this original idea of Zionism is very well known but only in academic circles. The average person will say no, the Jews became Zionists because they wanted to escape anti-Semitism. It's not the case. Anti-Semitism was just a symptom of something wrong with the Jews. And you can find this in many, many places. I have a book over here that I brought. You may know the author of this book. It's called We Are Not One by a guy, Eric Alterman, professor in Brooklyn College. On page 13, a view consistent with Zionist ideology which sought to rebel against what its writers and thinkers held to be the shameful history of Jewish diasporic living. The early 20th century Zionist poet and author, Joseph Chaim Brenner, for example, called diaspora Jews, quote, gypsies and filthy dogs. The view spans the Zionist ideological spectrum with thinker Aaron David Gordon, considered one of labor Zionism's most influential early writers and thinkers, describing diaspora Jewish life as the, quote, parasitism of a fundamentally useless people. Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky, that's this guy, the founder of revisionist Zionism, which today morphed, by the way, into the Likud party, calling them ugly, sickly yids and insisting that Zionists must, quote, eliminate the diaspora or the diaspora will eliminate you. The Zionists didn't like Jews all that much and they figured that the reason why they're anti-Semites is because the Jews deserve it. There's Yosef Chaim Brenner. He was quoted in that book. I have a different quote from him. If the tables were turned and others were like the Jews, would we not have good cause to hate them as well? Uri Tzvi Greenberg, those loath, these are all big Zionist thinkers, those loathsome Jews are vomited out by any healthy collective and state, not because they're Jews, but because they're Jews, Jewish repulsiveness. David Ben-Gurion referred to Jews as sterile Jewish masses living parasitically off the body of an alien economic body. Please remember that word, parasite, parasitic. Altman quoted another Zionist saying that as well because we'll get to somebody else that used that insult as well. A corrupt existence of middlemen. That is David Ben-Gurion. This Zionist, guys that look like that, guys that look like this, guys that look like this, he may look like a rabbi, but he really wasn't. A lot of guys look like that in those days. Um, <laughs> guys that look like this, they were the new type of Jew, the type of Jew that they figured no one's going to hate us. They were intellectuals. 
A lot of them were smart. A lot of them were, were capable. And yet the anti-Semites hated them. They blamed the Jewish people for being hated. And they said, even if anti-Semitism would disappear off the face of the earth, we have to change the Jews. They're disgusting. We're disgusting. They were ashamed of their Jewishness. Parasites. Jews are parasites. Here's somebody else that used that, by the way. The Jew is never a nomad, but only and always a parasite in the body of other peoples. Adolf Hitler. Ben-Gurion claimed that one who defines Judaism as unchanging philosophy, meaning orthodox Judaism, quote, describes Jewish religious law as Nazi ideology. The Zionists hated the Jews and they hated Judaism. They hated the religion. They blamed the religion for the decrepit state of the Jews. And the religion made Jews crazy. I mean, what kind of normal people would not want, smart people, the Jews were smart people. What kind of normal people would not want to be lawyers and architects and be involved in art and the, the words they use were be involved in history. Don't you want to be part of history? History is, where are you? Where are your, your, your inventions? Where are you? We had no interest. Imagine like, as a ma in a manner of speaking, by way of analogy, uh, monks on top of a mountain, a you know, Shaolin temple or something, but without the, you know, beating, every, beating each other up. That's what the Jews wanted. The Jews just wanted to be, as the Bible says, Mamleches Kehanim V'goy Kodosh, priestly people and a kingdom of, of, of scholars, a holy people, as the King David said, there's only one thing that I want. And these people hated that. Now, they were free to do as they pleased, but they tried and it didn't work. That was the dilemma. That was the Zionist dilemma. Now, what do we do about these disgusting Jews? Well, how do we change them? How do we change the Jews? So I, I, I'll tell you a very simple idea. Well, this was their idea. Zionism, the Zionist solution. Let's say I wanted to change the Christians, okay? Let's say I wanted to make the Christians less Christian, less religious. Let's say I wanted to make them into, I don't know, something that the world appreciates better than, than religion. And I don't mean anything specific about Christians, I'm just using them as an example. I wanted them to be baseball players. I'm going to ch tell the Christians they should be baseball players. Life will be much better for them. So here's what I'm going to do. Now, if I try to convince the Christians and go to them and say, hey, Christians, give up your religion and become baseball players, they're not going to cooperate with me, right? So here's the plan. The plan is I'm going to create an educational institution from grade school, from kindergarten up, and I'm going to teach all these kids that the Christians originally were baseball players. Jesus was an all-star, or well, the Gospels were his players. And this crazy stuff about religion and Messiah and Trinity and God, that was added later when the Christians were persecuted because they were like traumatized. So in order to maintain their identity, some kind of pride, they had to make believe they were a religion because no one would let them play baseball. But that's really what they always aspired to be. That's always what they were. And I'm going to teach that to the kids. So when they grow up, they'll understand that. And they'll teach it to their, own, their kids. And I'm going to buy the Christians. I'm going to make a movement for the Christians to become baseball players. I'm going to buy them bats and balls, and I'm going to make pinstripe uniforms that says Christians across the chest. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get them a, 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 a stadium to play in. And before you know it, I'm going to redeem Christianity from this nonsensical idea that it's a religion, and they'll all become baseball players. And not only that, but these new Christians will feel so proud that they finally have reached the aspirations of all the old Christians in all the olden days. They have redeemed the decrepit state of the Christians, finally renewed the Christians, brought them back to their real identity, to their roots. Where? Oh, we need a town. Every baseball team has a town, right? They're not going to be like uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. So we have to get, I have a great town for them. They're going to be the Roman, the Vatican. They call them the Vatican, I don't know, Vipers, okay? That'll be the Christian team. And why am I using the Vatican? Why do I want it in Rome? Because we know that that has a, the Christians have a soft spot for that place. But instead of making it a religious significance, I'm going to change it to a sports significance. That's what the Zionists' idea was for the Jews. 
except instead of making them into baseball players, we're going to make them into a nation. We're going to take the Jews. We're going to take the Jews and we're going to make them into a nationality. There are plenty of people that claim they're the real Jews. The Christian supersessionists said they're the real Jews. They have the authentic interpretation of the Jewish religion. Orthodox Jews say we have the authentic interpretation of the Jewish religion. The reformed conservative, conservative Jews say they do. The yeah, black Hebrews say they do. But everybody agrees that it's a religion. The question is, what's the proper interpretation? Now, truth is, I'm right, and they're all wrong. But <laughs> they all think that they're right. The Zionists had this new idea. It's not a religion. Is a nationality. We're going to get them. What, what makes a nationality? Well, a land, a language, a culture, a flag, a history, a national anthem. Let's get them a land. The Jews had no land. There is a holy land, kind of like the Vatican, by way of analogy. By the way, uh, originally, uh, the original Zionist Congress that Theodore Herzl uh, convened, there were some Orthodox Jews, not many, because obviously this whole thing is an attack on the religion. But there were some Orthodox Jews that figured that, you know what, at least if the Zionists can find us a safe place to live and help us against anti-Semitism where we won't be a minority, let's play along with them. We'll never allow them uh, the ideological uh, hegemony of uh, the Jews, but we will allow them to find us a place. But then when the question came, what land to take? To take Palestine, there was a Uganda plan, other plans, the religious Jews said, we're not, we don't want Palestine. It's dangerous over there, much easier to get another place of land. All we care about is a safe place. It was the non-religious Jews, guys like Herzl, who, who, who wanted, who liked Christianity more than Judaism. You know the old Jewish joke, right? What's the difference between Herzl and Jesus? Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, Herzl celebrated Christmas. <laughs> Herzl was against Judaism. He hated Judaism. He described Jews as, as, as dis, in the most disgusting terms you could think of. Um, and, but he said, no, no. Palestine, Palestine, we're going to create a new Jewish identity. It's not going to be a holy land to us, to me. Uh, uh, Palestine, Eretz Yisrael, is, is a holy place, just like there are holy days, Sabbath is holy, Yom Kippur is holy, there are holy places in this world. It doesn't matter who owns it. When the Romans owned it, it was still Jerusalem, it was still holy. But when the Turks owned it, the Mamluks, the, it doesn't matter, the British, it's, it's a holy place, it has holiness. And today, by the way, part of Lebanon is considered holy. The borders of the Holy Lands include north part of Lebanon, somewhere south of Beirut. I don't know exactly what town would be there, but somewhere. And a lot, the southern tip of Israel, is not part of the Holy Land. And no more holiness than Paris. But the Zionists said, no, we want to make this land a holy shmoly. No, this is going to be the motherland, the fatherland, the national homeland. La patria in French, a fatherland, or mother Russia. Like the pagan relationship between a person and the land, the soil and the blood, blood and Boden, these things. That's what we're going to change. Like my, my analogy with the Christians, they're going to change the Vatican into that. They're going to change the Holy Land into that. We've got to give them a language. The Jews don't care what language they speak. It's the content of your speech, not the, the language in which you speak it that matter, matters. We use Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, uh, or biblical Hebrew, rabbinic Hebrew for uh, holy studies and for prayers, but there's no reason to speak it, and it wasn't even a speakable language. And the, there's a YouTube clip, a funny thing, where the Pope came to visit Netanyahu in Israel, and they're speaking through an interpreter, and Netanyahu is telling the Pope how great Israel is and the significance it has to Christians, and he said, Jesus lived here, and he spoke Hebrew here. So the Pope corrects him, he says, no, Aramaic. <laughs> yeah, no, they didn't speak Hebrew in the, in the Second Commonwealth. They, they spoke Aramaic. We still study our, our Gemara. Any decent rabbinical student can, understands Aramaic, at least rabbinic Aramaic, the dialect. We still do. We, there's some Hebrew, there's some Aramaic, but he, it's not important. No, no, we need a language because without a language, you're not a people. People have languages, uh, Americans, uh, there's a whole theology, there's a whole um, 
philosophy behind it. The first thing, the first thing how a person, kid, he binds with his, his mother, his father, is, is through language, you know? So language binds people together. If America would have a war with the Chinese, we could understand it. But if America would have a war with, let's say, Canada or England and other English-speaking people, we would feel we, we feel more connected to people that speak the same language. It's just psychological. The Jews need a special language. You see, the problem is the Jews had no national symptoms. They didn't have a land, they didn't have a language, they didn't have a culture. The Syrian Jews here on Ocean Parkway and the German Jews in Washington Heights in Manhattan and the Ethiopian Jews and the Russian Jews all have different cultures, but they're all equally Jews. No, we got to get a Jewish culture. We got a Jewish food. Uh, they, uh, we got to give them Jewish names, but the cultural Jewish names. Uh, they're, they're, everybody knows how the Zionists changed their names from Polish names to more Middle Eastern sounding names, right? That's because they needed to have a Jewish culture. There's no such thing as a Jewish culture. There's Jewish religion. There are different cultures. There's Ashkenaz Jewish culture, German Jewish culture, Ethiopian Jewish culture. I have a friend, my son has a friend who's, who's gray, had a picture of his grandfather who was a a Yemenite, Moroccan, I'm not sure, one of the two, he's sitting on the floor with a turban, a, a earring, and, and smoking a hookah. He no, I'm serious. He, 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 and he's, he was a Jew, a regular Jew. And there's other Jews that, that, that are looked like blonde hair, blue-eyed Germans. There's no, the Jews had no Jewish culture. There's a Jewish religion with various different cultures. We need a culture. Now, generically, hummus is a Jewish food. Don't ask me why. Um, it, uh, I, I don't know, but they, they changed into Jewish names. Get them a flag. Jews never had a flag. We never had a symbol of our religion. The Star of David has religious significance, but it wasn't a symbol of the religion, meaning it has no holiness. You're allowed to throw it in the garbage, bring it into the, to the bathroom, holy objects you are not. Um, it means the simplest, uh, it's a Kabbalistic symbol. The simplest meaning is it refers to God, who is uh, up, down, and four corners of the earth points to up, down, and north, south, east, west. It refers to God. Everything in Judaism, everything refers to God. And now it's going to refer to the people. Get them a new history. I'm sure you've heard about how the Jews always had a soft spot, soft spot, a longing, a longing for Jerusalem in their hearts, correct? Next year in Jerusalem, they say, I'm sure all of you have heard this from Zionists. I want to tell you a secret they're not telling you. The Jews in Jerusalem today also pray next year in Jerusalem. You know why? Because the Jerusalem we're praying for is not the Jerusalem that exists today. The Jerusalem we're praying for is the, the, when the holiness will reveal itself and there will be a spiritual renewal of the world. And the, as the prophets say, the uh, wolf will lie down with the lamb and the world will be renewed and there won't be any there won't be any wars after in messianic times and, and then the holiest place Jerusalem and the holiest land Eretz Yisrael that's where we're going to live because we're going to be more of a holy people and the world will be holier it has nothing to do with national self-determination has nothing to do with politics zero but they say no we always want the national self-determination no it's not true see if these people would really be religious instead of just once a year doing the Passover Seder they would mention to you that every day three times a day we pray for Jerusalem in our prayers they just don't pray all the time but there we pray for a resurrected King David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem so yeah if the Zionists can get me a resurrected King David, a messianic renewal of the world, and all of that, we could talk about whether that's a fulfillment of the aspirations, but it's nothing. The Zionists just took it in the same way that I described what I would do if I wanted to make the Christians into ball players, and I'd make them the, the uh, Vatican, what I say? Uh, Vipers. Vatican Vipers, yeah, the Vatican Vipers. <laughs> now you have the Zionist Jews, the same thing. Make them a new, the national anthem. By the way, you think that Israel's national anthem is Jewish? <laughs> I saw on a website what a, what a, um, uh, what a hauntingly Jewish tune it is. I want to show you something. Hope the internet works. <laughs> okay, now, this is a Karul Kuboy, a Romanian folk traditionalist song. Let me know, if you listen carefully, if you recognize the melody. Până ce electricita 
spate căi ferate și vapori Încă nu erau aflate, mergeau toate fără zor Căci bătrâi erau moi, își mânau caruri cu voi Căi șcea, căi șcea, căi șcea, căi șcea Căi șcea, căi șcea, căi șcea, căi șcea It's an old Romanian folk song, and the Romanians got it from somewhere also. Okay, there is nothing... How do I get back to my computer? There is nothing Jewish about Zionism. The Zionists took their culture, they took their names, they took their um, ideology from all sorts of places. They took it from Christian Zionism. The Christians, by the way, had Zionists had Zionism way before the Jews did, late 1500s, early 1600s, where they a lot of the ideas that people think are Jewish Jewish uh, really came from the Christians. For example, everybody knows the famous saying of the Zionists: "A people without a land for a land without a people." It was the Christian Zionists that said that before any Jewish one. The idea that the Jews should speak Hebrew in the land was not Theodor Herzl. He didn't think it was possible to speak Hebrew. They, they had to invent the language. To invent uh, the Hebrew language was not easy. They, we only have a few hundred, couple hundred roots in ancient Hebrew. They invented a whole new language, and I'll get to that in a moment. But they, they had to invent, they had invented, it was the Christians that had that idea. And even a lot of the, when you see somebody like Netanyahu invoke the Bible, He's not invoking the Jewish version of the Bible. He's invoking the evangelical Christian one. For example, not long ago, Netanyahu visited the Auschwitz concentration camp, and he made a speech about a verse in the book of Yechezkel, Ezekiel, where the prophet saw dry bones coming out of the ground and then growing flesh and becoming live again. He said that this prophecy is fulfilled in the state of Israel. There is not a single Jewish source that says such a thing but rather it is an, uh, John Hayden Spurgeon, about 150 years ago, he invented it. Uh, John Hagee says it a lot. It is a evangelical Christian interpretation. Recently we heard Netanyahu say that the Palestinians are Amalek. Um, that is not a Jewish interpretation. He invented that. Netanyahu invented that. So they made the Jews into a nationality. And this nationality, we'll get to, uh, I'll explain in a moment why he's busy with religion if he's only a nationality. And by the way, Netanyahu is not religious at all. He doesn't keep any of the commandments. He's not an observant Jew in the slightest. He, in fact, a number of years ago, they asked me to come to Poland because they wanted to outlaw the Jewish uh, ritual slaughter of animals, shrita it's called, in Poland. And in and, and the Polish parliament, they had a debate about it, and one of them said that Netanyahu was in Poland, and he didn't eat kosher food. So that means Jews don't need kosher food. The problem is Netanyahu doesn't represent the Jews. Netanyahu is a heretic. He's a kefer. He has nothing to do with the Jewish people, absolutely nothing. But yet he quotes these things, and we'll get to, that, get to that in a moment. Now let's go back a bit to Vladimir Jabotinsky, because you see, if you take a people and you say, I'm going to create a nationality out of nothing, you now have a blank slate to make that the culture of that nationality, the ideology of that nationality, the values and aspirations of that nationality, anything you want. And the Zionists had that in front of them. We're creating a new people, a new nation. Imagine a country with a people, that's our goal. What are the values? What are the aspirations? Let's go back to Jabotinsky. Well, here's one of the things he had against the Jews. The ghetto despised physical manhood. The principle of male power is understood and worshiped by all free peoples in history. Physical courage and physical force were of no use, prowess of the body rather an object of ridicule. The only true heroism the ghetto acknowledged was that of self-suppression and dogged obedience 
to the will above. In other words, the Jews in the ghetto wanted only to study and to pray to God, to be like those priests, and that was disgusting to Jabotinsky because where's your power? Where's your manhood? That was a word that was repeatedly used, manhood. Where is it? And we need to do something about it. And here is the plan how to make a Zionist, the new nation, according to Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky, by the way, Vladimir Jabotinsky, today, Benjamin Netanyahu considers his mentor, Benjamin Netanyahu's father, Ben Sian Netanyahu, was a protege of Jabotinsky. The Likud party, he founded what later morphed into it. Look, listen to this. You want to know the difference between a Jew and a Zionist? These are his words. To imagine what a true Hebrew is, they called themselves Hebrews in, in those days. Uh, there was no Israel yet, Hebrews as opposed to Jews. To picture his image on our minds, we have no example from which to draw. What is a Hebrew? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to make ourselves into instead? We must use the method of Ibcha Mistavra, that's a rabbinic saying, it means do the opposite. Ibcha means the opposite, Mistavra means make sense. The opposite makes sense. We take as our starting point the Jid. Jid is a derogatory name for Jews that were used in Russia, kind of like Kaik. We take as our starting point the kike of today and try to imagine in our minds his exact opposite. Let us erase from that picture all the personality traits that are so typical in a jid and let us insert into it all the desirable traits whose absence is so typical in him. Continue. Because the jid, the kike, is ugly, sickly, and lacks handsomeness, he, handsomeness he's talking about me. We shall endow, <laughs> we shall endow the ideal image of the Hebrew with masculine beauty, stature, massive shoulders, vigorous movements, bright colors and shades of color. The kike is frightened and downtrodden. The Hebrew ought to be proud and independent. The kike is disgusting to all. The Hebrew should charm all. The kike has accepted submission. The Hebrew ought to know how to command. The kike likes to hide with bated breath from the eyes of strangers. The Hebrew, with brazenness and greatness, should march ahead to the entire world, look them straight and deep in their eyes, and hoist before them his banner, I am a Hebrew. The idea of Zionism was to create a Jewish people to overcorrect and overcompensate for all the disgusting character traits, values, and aspirations that the Jewish people had at when they were all people like me. If you want to know the difference between a Jew and a Zionist, by design, a Zionist is the opposite of the character of a Jew, the opposite of the personality of a Jew, the opposite of the aspirations of a Jew, and the opposite of the values of a Jew. Now, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, every Tuesday and Thursday, the Zionists talk about how we're not, I'm not a Jew with trembling knees. That was Menachem Begin's fa uh, famous line. He said, I don't care about the UN. We don't need anybody's support. I'm not a Jew with trembling knees. I want to tell you now where that came from. See, the Zionists, as I said, set up a whole educational system. Not to say that, not to dehumanize Palestinians. There were no Palestinians in Europe when Zionism uh, started. It was to dehumanize Jews, the traditional Jews. They made fun of them, they mocked them, they caricaturized them, and dehumanized them. And I'm going to read you a poem by Israel's greatest poem, ch poet, Chaim Nachman Bialik. It's called City of Slaughter. It's translated into English, but they did a good job. It's about the Kishinev pogrom of 1903, about how the Jews reacted and how the Zionists should react. And please, if you're disgusted, I share your disgust. So it's talking about a bunch of pogromniks came in, killed, maimed, raped the Jewish people, mostly women and children. What were the men doing? In that dark corner and behind that cask, cask crouched husbands, bridegrooms, brothers peering from the cracks, watching the sacred bodies struggling underneath, stifled in filth and swallowing their blood, watching from the darkness and its mesh the lecherous rabble portioning for booty, their kindred and their flesh. 
Crushed in their shame, they saw it all. They did not stir nor move. They did not pluck their eyes out. They beat not their brains against the wall. Perhaps, perhaps, each watcher had it in his heart to pray, a miracle, O Lord, and spare my skin this day. Those who survived this foulness crawled forth from their holes. They fled to the house of the Lord. They offered thanks to him, the sweet benedictory word. The priests sallied forth to the rabbi's house they flitted. Tell me, O oh rabbi, tell, is my own wife permitted? The matter ends and nothing more, all is, all is as it was before. Come now and I will bring thee to their layers, the privies, jakes, and pig pens, where the heirs of the Hashmonoyim lay with trembling knees. This is where it comes from. Concealed and cowering, the sons of the Maccabees, the seed of saints, the signs of lions, who, crammed by scores in all the sanctuaries of their shame, so sanctified God's name. It was the flight of mice they fled, the scurrying of roaches was their flight. They died like dogs and they were dead. We have sinned and sinned have we, self-flagellative with Self-flagellation with confessions whips. Their hearts, however, do not believe their lips. Is it then possible for shattered limbs to sin? Wherefore their cries imploring, their supplicating din? Speak to them, bid their rage. Let them against me rage their outraged hand. Let them demand, God is talking now, demand the retribution for the shame. Let fists be flung like stones against the heaven and the heavenly throne. Jews were cowards. They let their wives be raped and, and, and they're, they're, they're murdered and slaughtered because they were cowards. They were not men. They were not strong men. They were not warriors. A zehu gibor, our sages teach us, who is strong, Hakoibesh has Yitzra, he who conquers himself. Jews are pacifists. The Zionists are the opposite. And poems like these and, and, and caricatures like these, and this is not the only one oodles and oodles, bales of books and articles all over the mags, all over the Jews. You don't want to be like those Jews. They're disgusting, pogroms. You know why people hurt them? Because they're weak. They don't stick up for themselves. They let people kill them. We're not going to do it anymore. Hundred, over a hundred years this has been going on. An overcorrection for the saintly pious, studious, religious Jew that was not interested in anything except being a priestly people and a holy society. The opposite, they blamed all the anti-Semitism on us and this is what they wanted to create. And this is what they created, identity theft. The language, even the language in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, it's all to dehumanize and demoralize and degrade the old type Jew. So for example, there's a word in rabbinic literature uh, which means the if there's a rabbinic question that was that remains unresolved, uh, there's no answer. They couldn't find the conclusion. It's called teiku, T-A-I-K-U. I guess you spell it. Today, that word in modern Hebrew means a tie in a soccer game. You see what they're trying to do, to take the religion and make it into a so you have a son. Uh, and, a, and a grandfather, grandfather looks like me, and the kid, the father says, well, the rabbis had a disagreement that ended up take you, and the kid starts laughing. Well, there's a word that we use when referring to God. God we, in Judaism, and actually in Islam, uh, is the same thing, totally simple, without any uh, characteristics, attributes, um, first cause, necessary existence. But sometimes in the Bible, it uses metaphors for God. God got angry. God looked, God saw, God came, God went with an outstretched arm. Whenever we mention those type of uh, metaphors, we say the word kaviyochol, which means in a manner of speaking. And it's used 99.9% .9 only in regard to God, to mean that it doesn't mean literally in a manner of speaking. Today in Israel, kaviyochol means ha, as if, baloney. So what's been used, when somebody tells somebody, I know, uh, uh, the Martians landed, ha, kaviyochol, as if. A word that was used to describe the God's attributes is now used to describe a joke. The word agada, which is used in our Talmuds to mean the ethical, moral teachings as opposed to the legal teachings, now in Israel means a fairy tale. Stories of our sages, which were called agada, now means fairy tale. In modern Hebrew, that's what they did with that language. 
Here's what they created, an artificial identity for the Jews, artificial history for the Jews, artificial aspirations for the Jews, artificial values for the Jews, artificial friends and enemies for the Jews. We'll get to that last one in a moment, but this is the second part of my subtitle, Zionism's Journey from Identity Crisis to Identity Theft. We're going to re we're going to be the Jews. Now, the Zionists are different than, let's say, the, the supersessionist Christians. They'll say, we're the real Jews and, they're, and the Orthodox are not. These say that we are the state of the Jewish people. We represent all Jews, religious, non-religious, it doesn't matter. We are their center of gravity. We are their state. This is, the next slide is the most important, this is the crux of the matter, and it's all based on what we had until now. It is a failed identity. Israel wanted to create a new identity for the Jews, but it failed. How is Israel different than all other countries in the world? I'll tell you. Every single country in the world except Israel is the country of its citizens. Israel is the country of the Italians. France is the country of the French. Now, there's an Italian-American who once lived in uh, Italy and a French-American who once lived in France. Israel is not the country of the Israelis. Israel, by its law, the nation-state law of 2018, and by Zionist ideology, is the country of the Jews. Again, France is to the French, what Japan is to the Japanese, what Italy is to the Italians, what Israel is to the finish the equation. It should be the Israelis. And if Israel, without the ideology of Zionism, I want to separate now the country Israel from Zionism. Soviet Russia was a country that was driven by an ideology called communism. Israel is a country driven by an ideology called, ideology called Zionism. And I want everybody here to understand now what Zionism is. Without Zionism, Japan is to the Japanese, what France is to the French, what Israel is to the Israelis. Doesn't matter what religion you are, doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, just like there could be a Jewish American, there could be a Jewish Israeli. Italian American could be an Italian Israeli. That's without Zionism if Israel would be a regular country. With Zionism, Japan is to the Japanese, what France is to the French, what Israel is to the Jews. This means two things. Thing number one, I, an American, born in America, never lived in Israel, don't plan on living in Israel. My father's family's from Poland, they've been there centuries, and my mother's family's from England and Russia. Israel claims that it is my country, meaning this, Netanyahu came here to America when, during the Barack Obama's administration and he said that I represent, he wanted to kill the Iran nuclear deal, he said I, hear, I am here speaking for not only the people that voted for me, but all the Jews all around the world. This guy says he's my prime minister. Naftali Bennett, then minister of education, later prime minister of Israel, said that Netanyahu is, uh, when Barack Obama insulted Netanyahu, I'm a rabbi so I can't use the word that he used, chicken blank, uh, it meant coward. He insulted him and Naftali Bennett then said that Obama, that he said that uh, Netanyahu is not merely the Prime Minister of Israel, he's the Prime Minister of all the Jews. And an insult to Netanyahu is an insult to the Jews. Israel, by law, says it's the state of the Jews. Uh, Jonathan Pollard, that spy, that criminal who spied on America for Israel, did his time, he now lives in Israel, and he recently said, it's been written in all the Israeli newspapers, that we all, American Jews, should spy on America for Israel. Because Americans have dual loyalty. Zionism, yes, is anti-Semitic because it claims it's the country of Jews. That's thing number one. Thing number two, if it's the country of the Jews, even if you don't live in Israel, then it's not the country of the non-Jews, even if you do live in Israel. Only Jews have self-determination rights in Israel. This means basically that, yeah, sure, you can find non-Jews who are in positions of government in Israel, Supreme Court justices, as long as those guys remain a minority. They could do whatever they want. But only self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. Making Jewish neighborhoods is a, is a uh, Israeli, is a actual value in Israel. This is by law. 
That is what makes Israel different than all other countries. If you want, if Zionism would be eliminated, then Japan would be to the Japanese what Israel's to the Israelis. Very simple. Because of Zionism, Japan is to the Japanese what Israel's to the Jews. And listen to this. Do you know why they say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism? Very simple. This is what they say. Well, if Japan is to the Japanese what Israel is to the Jews, you can't be against the existence of Japan and for the Japanese nationality. Doesn't make sense. You can't be against the existence of France and for the French nationality. So too, you cannot be against the existence of Israel and be for the Jews. It's all based on that. I have a book over here written by Benjamin Netanyahu called The Place Among the Nations. The title means the Jews are now one of the nationalities. Right here on page 88. He, he's explaining why, if you're against Zionism, you're an anti-Semite. I'm just, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Zionist, thank you, is the equivalent of, I'm not anti-American, I just think the United States should not exist. All of this, all of this, all of Zionism, every thought, every deed, every act, Every statement that Zionists made is based on that principle. Zionism is different than, Israel is different than all other countries in the world because Israel is the country of the Jews, not the country of its citizens, the Israelis. That is Zionism. In fact, the problem is Zionism, Israel has not defined what a Jew is and therefore they have not defined what a Jewish state is. So I have over there the Brother Daniel contradiction. Thank you. Okay. Remember what I said a Jew is? A Jew is somebody that received the law on Mount Sinai? Well, if it's a nationality, then tell me, how do you know if somebody's a Jew? Now, if, if Israel's a state country of the Israelis, then anybody who's an Israeli citizen is an Israeli national. But by Israeli law, there's no such thing as an Israeli nationality. It's only a Jewish nationality and Israeli citizenship. And how does anybody get an Israeli nationality? Well, it's a problem because they invented it. It doesn't exist. I mean, a Jewish nationality, I'm sorry. How does somebody get a Jewish nationality? It doesn't exist. It's a delusion. So how do you, they have a law of return that if you're Jewish, you're, you're allowed to become a citizen, no questions asked. But how do you know you're Jewish? Now, we have rabbinic laws that decide if you're Jewish. If you have a Jewish mother but not a Jewish father, you're Jewish. If you have a Jewish father but not a Jewish mother, you're not Jewish. If you're pregnant and you converted to Judaism, the child is Jewish who's born, but it's a question or been a question. We don't have an answer, really. It's not so simple whether that kid is considered converted together with the mother at the time of her pregnancy or he, was born, or, he or she was born Jewish. The difference is that somebody who's converted when they were minor and adopted can renounce their Jewishness when they come of age. Can this baby, it's a very good question. We have very specific laws as to who's a Jew and who's not a Jew, because we have thousands of years of, of rabbinic scholarship on this, but if it's a nationality, what, what criteria are you going to use? Well, Ben-Gurion said the Knesset gets to decide who's a Jew, and here are some of their decisions. There was a guy, Brother Daniel, Brother Daniel Refusion. I call him brother because he was a Carmelite monk, born Jewish. Brother Daniel was no anti-Semite. He hid in a monastery during World War II, later decided to convert. And afterward, he, helped, he saved a lot of Jews from the Holocaust, helped them escape into forests. After the Holocaust in 1948, he wanted to move to Israel based on the law of return because he was born Jewish. Now, mind you, if you're an atheist and you don't practice any religion, of course you're Jewish according to Israeli law. If your mother's Jewish, uh, then you're Jewish according to Israeli law. Now, where did Israel get this law if not the religion? They don't really have a place. That's why the chief rabbinate has so much power over uh, Israeli civil acts because there is no other criteria by which to decide who's a Jew, who's married. There's no such thing as a Jewish nationality. So this brother Daniel decided, I'm Jewish. If I'd be an atheist, you'd accept me. Ben-Gurion was an atheist. Herzl was an atheist. Jabotinsky was an atheist. They told Brother Daniel there was this big Supreme Court case in Israel. Ah, uh -uh, you're a Christian, you're not Jewish. Like what? So if you don't believe in any God or any Messiah, you're Jewish. 
If you believe in the Jewish God and the Jewish Messiah, you're Jewish. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and God is a Trinity, you're not Jewish. That doesn't make sense. And if Brother Daniel would say, okay, you know what, I'm an atheist now. Okay, now you're Jewish, now you can come here. But Judaism is not a religion, it's a nationality. It doesn't make any sense. It's a contradiction. And the reason why Zionism is a contradiction is very simple. If, let's say, you don't believe in the number four. You count one, two, three, five. You don't believe in four, deny its existence. It's a free country, you can believe whatever you want, right? <laughs> but now, let me ask you something. What's 10 minus six? Go work it out. you would be the best mathematician in the world. It's not going to work. The, for thousands of years, Jews have been only one thing. This has been the definition of a Jew. Torah, mitzvahs, you receive the law, religion, religious obligations, that's it. If you want to take a Jew and say, no, now you're a nationality, how are you going to work that out? The answer is you can't. It's contradictory. Religious conversion contradiction. Well, a Jew has nothing to do with a religion. Uh, but, uh, so if you're born Christian, not Jewish, uh, and you convert to Judaism through a rabbi, even though the rabbi doesn't believe uh, Judaism is a nationality, and the rabbi could be the biggest anti-Zionist. Now you're Jewish, you're Jewish national, now you can come to Israel. Can a Jew be a Christian? If a Jew is anything other than a religion, ethnicity, race, what have you, can a Jew be a Christian? Every ethnicity can practice Christianity, every, eth every race can practice Christianity or Islam. In fact, the early Zionists disagreed about this. There were those that said that when Zionism gets off the ground, that Jews will, uh, Jews that practice Christianity will guard the Holy Sepulchre, and Jews that practice Islam will guard the Omar Mosque. And other Zionists said, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want Jews walking around uh, looking like priests. That's not what we want. It doesn't make any sense. Now, how do they do this? How do they convince Jews to buy into this? So first, there's, I call it identity management. So first they have the Holocaust identity. I'm sure many of you noticed, or perhaps all of you, I hope all of you, as I was talking, it was kind of, um, pl I was plotting uh, when I said, when I read the poem about the city of slaughter, and I explained that how they, how, how they were, were traumatized and, and disgusted by the Jews with the trembling knees and they created Zionism to overcorrect that. So the Holocaust is great for them. You're either a Zionist or the Holocaust. Those are, look what happens if you're like Yaakov Shapiro. Look what happens if you're like the old time Jew. Look what happens if you don't stand up for yourself. Look what happens if you have weak knees. Look what happens, we, uh, Germany was a democracy. We tried. We tried everything. It didn't work. Look what happened in the Holocaust. You want another Holocaust? There's only one solution, Jabotinsky's solution. We have to develop, and they did through 100 years, a personality, values, aspirations, just the opposite of the Jews. They have a victim identity. You want to hear a song? A Zionist song. Another one, not Koi Boy, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> they have, there's a song, it's called Halom Kolon Agdain. It was, it was an uppity folk song in Israel. It's a nice, catchy tune. It means the whole world is against us. <laughs> they're, they're dancing and singing. The whole world is against us. They all want to kill us. They always did. Our forefathers, they wanted to kill them. They wanted to kill us too. And some of the uh, videos they have interdispersed with Netanyahu, you know, with a picture of the bomb that he had, and, and the Iranian uh, head of state, and these guys, and have a bunch of kids singing. You know, huh? and, and then it ends, well, we don't care about them either. They don't care about us. They all want to kill us. We don't care about them. And you know what? They can all go to hell. That's how it ends.
Now, these new Jews, you understand, they're, they're brought up to be taught that the whole, that the definitive moment of Jewish history was the Holocaust. And Holocaust studies, all of these things, Holocaust museums, Holocaust studies, they're all good, except for one thing. The last chapter in all the Holocaust studies books is the state of Israel. When the kids go to Auschwitz to see their, uh, the, the site of the concentration camp, they come out wearing Israeli flags because the state of Israel is the solution to the whole fake Jewish history that they made. Yeah, of course Jews were persecuted, of course they were, but this, this poetry that they made and the caricature, that's just wrong. That's just, just completely off base, but this is how they're indoctrinated. And the last chapter, the only solution is Israel having a strong army. And anybody that doesn't like Israel is against the Jews because the Jew, what France is to the French, what France, what Israel is to the Jews. And without Israel, there are no Jews. How we existed before 1948 is anybody's guess. The no, whole thing doesn't make any sense. But th this is, it's all emotional because they want the adrenaline running and everybody wants to kill you and the Holocaust. And the Holocaust became part of their, of course, there are lessons in the Holocaust. Of course, you should remember the Holocaust. But the Holocaust became front and center of their consciousness. It literally became part of their identity, such that if you're not conscious of the Holocaust, then you, you don't exist. You have to. And the, the only solution to the Holocaust is to be like Jabotinsky, to be like those guys. And anybody that comes after Israel, they want to make another Holocaust because Israel is the redeemers. All Israel wants to do is, on one hand, they want to not be like the historical Jew that they caricaturized and invented the weak, disgusting, immoral Jew. You want us to go back to being that. Without Israel, what are we going to go back to being? To that Jew that cowered while his wife was being slaughtered and raped? To the immoral ghetto Jews? To the Jews that didn't know from art or culture or anything? Those Jews, that's what you want us to go back to? Jews only have two parts to their history. Either that, either pogroms, death, destruction, holocausts, or the disgusting Jew, the ghetto Jew, the Jew with the weak knee, or today in the state of Israel. It's multiple choice. That's all it is. We tried democracy with Hitler. It, it didn't work. And this is front and center. There was a guy, Stuart Alsop, who was a, um, he was a journalist for Thai, uh, Newsweek. I think it was Newsweek. He said, he went to Golda Meir and he said, you know you have a Masada complex. Masada was the, during the Second Temple, when the Romans destroyed it, there were a group of Jews, they were thugs actually, they were bad guys, they were criminals. They hold themselves up in an old Roman fortress and they, the legend has it, Israel teaches about how they fought and they used to, then they all died and they used to um, swear in Israeli soldiers at that site of Masada. The truth is, nobody fought. They committed suicide. There were a couple of survivors that hid under the dead bodies. They, there was no courage there at all, nothing. But uh, the idea of Masada, that legend, that, that the Jews would rather fight to the death rather than be captured by the Romans. This guy, Alsop, told Golda Meir, you have a Masada complex. And he was saying it to her because you can't talk to her straight about what's going on politically in Israel. And she said to him, yes, we have a Masada complex, and we have a Holocaust complex, and we have a pogrom complex. And they do. The problem is that normal people consider their complex as baggage that they want to get rid of, and they go to therapy to straighten themselves out. To the Zionist personality, they cultivate it. And it, because they didn't have those complexes, therefore there was a Holocaust. And you have a choice. Either be like us or be in a gas chamber. And this is their mindset. It's not just a mindset that, that they invented the last 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. It is 120, more than 120 years old, indoctrinated into them since they are little kids through songs, through magazines, through poetry, through everything. Now, the path forward. We only have 10 minutes. I'm gonna to explain to you what we need to do. And I know what I'm about to say is, not, is, is something new that 
people haven't heard it, but I am convinced without any shadow of a doubt that based on this idea of what Zionism is, this is, this is the path forward. See, as far as the Palestinians are concerned, I have a question. There are a lot of people that believe they're anti-Zionist, but they're not really. They are pro-Palestinian, there's a difference. Here's the difference. If let's say, here's a question theoretical for all you guys. Let's say there would be a two-state solution and the Palestinians would be happy with it, let's just say. And the Israelis would be happy with it. Let's say even the Palestinians get 95% of the territory and Israelis get 5% in the Negev desert. Let's just say, and everybody's happy. Are you happy? Why not? Well, I'm not happy. You know why? Because everything I just said about this is still true. Every, every objection to Zionism that I just mentioned, every nonsensical idea that Zionism has, every bad idea that Zionism has still exists. The Palestinians happen to have been in the place that the Zionists wanted. But if you want the Palestinians to be safe, doesn't mean you have anything against Zionism. If the Zionists would have taken Uganda and done the entire thing without any problem, with, they would have invented a gigantic island, built an island floating around like Noah's Ark in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And made, I would have the exact same problems that I have. Zionism would be the problem. See, the Soviet Union, if the Soviet Union attacks Afghanistan, it doesn't mean that communism, you're against communism because you, you're, you're against the attack of Afghanistan. You're against attacking Afghanistan. Communism is an ideology and Zionism is an ideology and it drives everything they do. I say, if you want to make peace, the best thing for everybody in the world is to attack this Zionism. Israel, Zionism means what Israel is to the Jews is the same, uh, what I Israel is to the Jews, what France is to the French. Israel has to be to the Israelis, what France is to the French. Then you have one democracy. The reason why Israel can't be a democracy, and it's not me saying that, Mayor Kahana, who nobody would claim to be an anti-Zionist, said you cannot have a Jewish state and a, democ and a democratic state. John Kerry said the same thing. Choose your, your poison, Kahana or Kerry. Uh, you, if it's a Jewish state, it's the state of the Jews, not the state of the Israelis. That's the issue. That's why all of this is happening. Israel must be exposed as the state of the Israelis, not the Jews, but this is all in our minds. The more we look at Israel as the Jewish state, the more we think Israel represents the Jews, the more we say Israel speaks in the name of the Jews, the more we look at Netanyahu as a Jewish leader as opposed to an Israeli leader, we are supporting Zionism. Zionism is up here, it's in the mind. It's a delusion that, it doesn't make any sense, it's self-contradictory, it's a delusion. But it's a delusion that as long as people are fooled into thinking it's true, it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, where you have this, this whole fake world. That's what it is, it's a delusion. So the solution is, start, look, I, this is not a short-term solution, I'm not telling you how to end the war, I'm not I, I don't know how to do that and it's not within my power, but I do know how to end Zionism. If everybody in the world would just look at Israel as, have, as having nothing to do with the Jewish people, has to do with the Israelis. I mean, even Hamas in their latest uh, paper that they, that they gave out, they said, we have nothing against the Jews, it's Zionism that, that, that we're against. If everybody would agree with that, but, but that Israel has nothing to do with the Jews. Israel has nothing to, which means like this. You know what this means? This means that never refer to Israel as the Jewish state. It's the Israeli state. If somebody does refer to Israel as the Jewish state, correct them. If you meet a Jew who's a Zionist, you see, you want to know what percentage of Jews are Zionists? <laughs> they won't tell you what Zionism means. If you say Zionism means you know, there's, Jews have a right to self-determination. Who's going to disagree with that? I mean, the Palestinians can say, you know what pro-Palestinian means? Palestinians shouldn't be killed. Who's going to disagree with that? You think Palestinians shouldn't be killed? You're pro-Palestinian. Anybody could put, make whatever definitions they want. The real definition of Zionism, according to Zionist law, is that Israel is to the Jews 
what France is to the French, meaning America is not my country, Israel is my country. You ask one of these Zionist Jews, do you th is America your country? Would you spy on Israel for America? Would you spy on America for Israel? If the answer is no, if you think you're an American, by nationality, you are not a Zionist. You are directly opposed to Zionism. And the Zionists won't tell you this because they just want Zionism to be, go support Israel, give them money so they can do whatever they want. And I'll tell you something else, and many people will not be happy with this. About 50-50, right, Fatima? It's about 50-50. But if we want to be intellectually consistent, this is really the thing. Many times, people come to me and ask me, okay, you're anti-Zionist? Fine. Now, first they come to me as if I'm a Zionist. They assume because I'm Jewish. Guy comes to me and says, uh, yeah, your country. I said, you mean America, United States? He says, no. I said, you mean Israel? He says, yes, yeah. I'm American. I'm insulted. But then people come to me and say, well, you're Jewish? You should come protest with us by the next Palestinian uh, protest. I say, hold on a second. You said because I'm Jewish? Why, because I'm Jewish, does my presence have a bigger standing? Is it more meaningful at a Palestinian protest? Are the Palestinians fighting the Jews? No. Are the Jews the combatants over here? No. So why, because I'm, if I would be Israeli, and you say, you know what, you're Israeli, come to the Palestinian protest, that may, you guys remember Jane Fonda? Jane Fonda in the days of the Vietnam War, I'm old enough to remember it, you guys are still in college, so either you're not doing well at all, or you're not old enough to remember it. <laughs> and so everybody was against the Vietnam War, all the Americans, and there was the celebrity Jane Fonda, uh, who was a big anti-war activist, and she, one time did a bad thing. Uh, she meant well, but she went to North Vietnam, who was our enemy, it was us in the South against North Vietnam, and posed with a anti-aircraft North Vietnamese tank. Now, even the people who were anti the Vietnam War didn't want American planes shot out of the sky. But that's the impression that Jane Fonda gave. Now, Jane Fonda's presence over there demoralized Americans because even an American is on the side of North Vietnam, okay? and. In the ancient times, the ancient armies would put uh, deserters from their enemy uh, who they're fighting in the front lines to show the, to show the enemy, that, to demoralize them. Now, here's a question. If you, the Palestinians want a Jane Fonda, what type of person are you looking for? Even so-and-so is on our side. You want Israelis, you want Zionists. If you're looking for Jews, then you're a Zionist, I hate to tell you. If you think that a Jew is, is the Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda was an American. It was an America against North Vietnam. And even an American is protesting with the North Vietnamese. I would love feedback on this. But if you want a Jew to say even a Jew, even a Jew is protesting with the Palestinians, what that implies, nested in there, invariably is that the Jews are the combatants here, and the only way that makes sense is if Israel is the state of the Jews, and if Israel is the state of the Jews, it's not the state of the Israelis, and what the Palestinians want is that Israel should not be the state of the Jews, it should be the state of the citizens. So you cannot say that Israel is the state of the Jews and be pro-Palestinian, or pro-Palestinian cause. You can't have both. 